Um, what we're going to cover today are things on singularity functions. And if that sounds cool, it is. We're going to start off by talking about it from, a, uh, from an intuition standpoint. And then we're going to talk about it involving the math. And we'll talk about three singularity functions in particular. By the way, can you hear me adequately? Yes, sir. Great. Math are, we're going to talk about step functions. We're going to talk about impulse functions. And then we'll talk about ramp functions. Step functions are U of T. Impulse are a impulse at T. And then a ramp is an R of T. And then last, I'll talk about how they can be applied to circuits. Because if they can't be applied to circuits, they're just mathematical curiosities and they belong in a math class, not in an electrical engineering class. So I'm going to start with the intuition. And the intuition is if we've got a capacitor and we initially, we're interested in the voltage across it. And let's make it something simple, like a one farad capacitor. And we're going to start it off with, a, with an initial charge on this capacitor. So VC at zero is equal to one volt. And at time equals zero, we're going to discharge it. And we'll discharge it through some resistor. Now, being cadets that like to see things blow up, what would you like this resistor to be when we discharge it? What would be an interesting value of R to make something really neat happen when we discharge it? Would be zero. Zero, right. Because if it's zero, that would force the voltage across that capacitor to instantly go from one volt to zero volts. And you know that the rule about capacitors is that they prevent voltages changing instantaneously. They would require an infinite amount of current to flow, so something crazy happens there. Now you know that it doesn't actually go, it, it can't in the real world have infinite current flows. So we are going to examine now what happens in the limit as R goes to zero. And we're gonna see what, what actually happens here. And let's start off by asking ourselves, well, what, what happens to VC of T as it goes towards zero? So to find VC of T, it's equal to V of infinity. Can you just tell me by looking at this, what V of infinity is? For V of infinity, what we're going to do is we're going to solve all four steps just in our heads because this is so simple. Really fast, tell me what V naught is. One volt. One volt. Tell me what V of infinity is. is it zero? It's going to be zero. Tell me what tau is. Or our time C and what C? One farad. One farad. So it's just so therefore tau is R C, which is just simply R. So therefore V C of T is going to be equal to one times e to the minus T over R. Okay with that? You're at the point that you can now solve all the steps almost in your head for a really simple circuit like this. But my question is, what does that look like? Let's graph it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine some value of R in there. And I'm going to start off with R equaling 1, just for argument's sake. So for R equal, and then we're going to do, and that will give us some sort of, of, of response. And then we'll run the entire simulation again, the thought experiment again, for a different value of R that's approaching zero, that gets progressively smaller. For R equals one, what is R, what do we start out at? Here's our, here's our voltage. What is this voltage at time equals zero? It's one. One. Mm -hmm. 
It's got to be because the initial condition is one. Regardless of what that R is, it starts off charged at one volt. What will it be after a long time? Zero. Zero. So it's going to, you know, it's going to exponentially decay. The question is how fast it's, ta it's tau is what for R equals one? One second. So after one second, we're going to see it be, you could just plug this in for one, for when t equals one second, if r is one, this is e to the negative one. e to the negative one happens to be about 0 0.3, 0 0.31. It's about a third anyway. So we know it's going to pass through this point. So it's going to look something like, like that. And that's for r equals one. If we make it a little bit smaller, let's make it r equals 0 0.1. So now our tau will be 0 0.1. So now, where is it going to start? What's its initial voltage? The one. Still, still one, e to the zero, right? Its initial voltage is what happens when t is zero. No matter what r is, this will always be e to the zero, which is one volt. So it's still going to start up here. But what's going to be different? And drops a lot faster. Drops a lot faster. So now we're going to. 0 0.1 volts will go, we'll have to go through this point. So that'll look something like, like this. We never, we know it never quite approaches zero, but it gets pretty gosh darn close. Wait, sir, so how, uh, how come it starts up at one again to this one? Well, there's two ways to answer that question. One is you can just simply plug it into the equation. So we could say, what is V of zero for any resistance at all? Well, it's E to the minus zero over R. Well, that's just equal to e to the minus zero. Well, that's always going to be equal to one. So no matter what my r is, I'm always going to start out at one volt. And another way to look at why that's so is that we set up here, our capacitor starts charged off at one volt. So it's got to start off at one volt. Okay. Make sense? Thank you. Yep. Okay. So good, good question though. It's, it's, you want to go through these things. Let's drop it again, a factor of 10. Let's make it r equals 0 0.01. Where does it start off as a voltage? One. Still one, but now this, this is one one hundredth and it's gonna just drop so fast, you almost just can't see it. At, point, at this point of, of one one hundredth, it reaches about this point of, of, mine, of point three, and then it just quickly looks like that. So, so that's our graph of, of different VCs of T. But that's not what the question asked. The question said, the, oh, <laughs> yeah, that is what my question is. I'm going to ask a new question, a better question, a more interesting question. The question you want to know, which is, what is the current? What is the current in the circuit? And I'm just going to write it I of T, because the current's the same everywhere. And let's do the same thing. Let's start off for R equals 1. So for R equals 1, Hmm. Can we evaluate the, without using any intuition, can we do it using math really fast? How can we find out I given, given V? Could we say I equals C dV dt and take the derivative of this? Would that work? I guess we have to define what our current is. So would this work? We know what our VC is. We've got it up here. So could we take a derivative of that multiplied by C to find I of T? Why or why not? I see two people nodding heads. I see Connor looks like he's having a drug-induced haze there. What do you guys think? I, I think that would, that's a proper way of solving it. Okay. So that's perfectly good, but it's not a smart way of solving it because derivatives are hard. So although this would certainly work, what's an even easier way? If you knew what VC is, yeah, just use Ohm's law. Just say it's equal to, I is always equal to uh, V over R. So if we know what the voltage is on this capacitor, it's the same as the voltage across the resistor. So it's gonna be um, just one over R times E to the minus T 
over R. Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So there's easy ways and hard ways to solve these things, I guess is the point. But now that we found out what our I is, let's draw it. What does our I start out with at time equals zero? If R equals one, what is, what does this thing evaluate to for time equals one zero? R. Always one over R, but R is one. So it starts off at one. So we're going to start off with one, one amp of current flowing. And then after one second, we know it's going to drop off to e to the minus one times r, which is about two thirds. So it'll look something like something like that and fade off into the distance. How about if we drop our r down and make it now r equals zero point one? What's that current start out with? Did I say s? I should have said that that should be one. I'm going to start out at 10. So now, with it at 1 tenth, it's going to start off, I'll draw it up here, as 10. And it's going to reach that 2, going to reach that 2 thirds point, that 1 third point here. And it will look like this. And then if I drop it down still further, What does it become? It's going to start out at 100. Yeah, way up here. I can't even, don't have an axis that high. And it's going to drop like a rock, right? It's going to look pretty much just like this. To the left, it was like that too. So it goes up really fast and down really fast. All right. So the intuition here is that you've got a fixed value capacitor, one farad. So it's pretty floppy. It's been pushed down by one volt of pressure in the beginning. And it's being allowed to spring back to its normal position. It's the same amount of water. It's the same amount of charge that's, that's, that's springing back every time. Do you guys remember what the formula is for the charge that's involved for a capacitor? Um, one half CV squared. Oh, that's close. That's the energy. It's true that the energy in a capacitor is one half CV squared. Just CV. Just CV, which kind of makes sense. The floppier the capacitor, the more water it holds. The higher the voltage pressure, the more water it holds. Okay, so either way, we get that right. Now, this capacitor is a one farad capacitor. We're charging it up to one volt. So we're always starting it off with one gallon, with one coulomb of charge with one gallon held in that, in that capacitor. And all that changes between our, between our blue, red, and green points is how fast that gallon is moving through. Anyone remember what the integral of charge, I'm uh, sorry, what the integral of current is? One over C times the integral of zero to T of. Uh, uh, that's. I might that's, be confusing me, I was inducted. <laughs> that's close. Um, the integral of charge, the integral of charge, I'm sorry, the integral of current is charge. Think about having a constant two gallon per minute, two gallon per second water source flowing out at a constant two amps of rate. How much charge, how much water flows into that bucket is just, that, is just the integral. You're just integrating up the amount of stuff you've got. And the reason why I'm telling you that is that it means that since our charge is the same for regardless of what our resistance is, no matter what the resistance in the circuit, when you started filling up that, charging that capacitor with one volt of, um, of pressure, it was always holding one gallon, that means that the area underneath the blue curve is the same, is, is one, which is the same as the area underneath that red curve, which is one, which is the same as that area underneath that really tall, thin curve, which is one. In the limit of these guys, as the resistance goes to zero, what you end up with is a weird peaky curve. It's zero everywhere, but it goes up infinitely high and it's infinitesimally small. In fact, I'll show it's really small by saying it's the limit as delta x 
goes to zero and it's got a delta x wide and it's one over delta x tall. So as delta x becomes small, this one over delta x becomes big. What's the area under the curve? Is, uh, is that your charge? Or, I mean, I, the peak as it goes and peaks and, and comes back down, is that your charge essentially trying to push that water? Um, Not the charge, but the current. The current trying what to a, push that water. Um, wait, wait, wait. The, Something pushing water is a voltage. Or the, so the, what it is, is it's the, is it's the current flow that's yeah, the moving current. the water. And that's what it is. And so what's the area underneath that charge curve? It'd be zero. It's, it's approaching zero. Well, let's see. It's, 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 it's area is always going to be the width times the height, right? So the width is delta x, and the height is 1 over delta x. So oh. what's the area? 1. 1. So think of a balloon, and as you squish it, it gets thinner and thinner, but the, the, the constant air in it, the constant volume, pushes it taller and taller. So it's got a constant area. So the integral of this thing is, we're going to call this, this weird thing delta t. And its integral over all time is 1. But if you were to try to evaluate what this thing is, in a piecewise continuous function, it would be, you, you couldn't, it would be infinite for t equals zero, and it would be zero otherwise, and that is completely unhelpful as a definition. So don't think of it that way. What I want you to think about it is this. It's the limit as delta x goes to zero of a rectangle that's of height one over delta x and of width delta x. Thumbs up. Excellent. All right. So that's the intuition for what a unit sample impulse. Often just said unit sample, often just said uh, unit impulse, often said just unit impulse is. And the symbol for it looks like this. Zero everywhere. We draw it with an arrow to show that it goes up to infinity and we place its, its area in parentheses. So this number is its area, not its height. What's its height? It's infinite. It's infinitely high. So it's a really weird function. It's zero everywhere except for an infinitesimal time where it's infinity high. Mathematicians hate it. Um, but as electrical engineers, we use it all the time. So questions on that? 